This is Harvard on the Map, presented by the Harvard Graduate School of Design, covering innovative ideas and thought leaders in digital cartography, earth observation, and all things geospatial, with your host, Jennifer Horowitz. Hello, and welcome to Harvard on the Map. Um, I am here with Joe Morrison, who is head of product success and impact at Umbra, but is also more importantly, the, the voice of Malcolm Morrison, which is my favorite blog of all time. I've literally read every blog post you've ever made, Joe, in, oh, in gotcha. like not a creepy way, three times. It's helped me so much in my life, in my career. It's helped me explain things to family members. I highly recommend listeners who are listening, tuning in. Um, thank you so much for being on the program. Wow, that, what an intro. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I, I'm super excited when I saw that you were running this regular interview series and some of the folks that you've had on already are just like legendary. So I'm not anywhere near the same uh, realm as them, but it's an honor to, to be interviewed, definitely. Wow, oh, thanks. Well, you had such a, a, an impact on my on, on everything I, I've done. So I, I just... I, you're also, your articles, in addition to being incredibly informative, are so funny too. I, there, there are so many lines, like, like, like there's, a, there's a line where you're describing how Google Maps' is moat is, is evaporating, which is a great way to put it. And then you, you say that, you know, at some point in your life or your career, if you're in the geospatial industry, you, you describe what you're doing as just, I build little pieces and parts of, of Google Maps. And that's, that's exactly what I, what I yeah, that's exactly what I described. I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna let you talk. No. So, <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, they say that never, never meet your favorite bloggers because they're not as intelligent or witty in person as they are in their, in their <laughs> writing. So I hope your expectations aren't too high here, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so you were currently work at Umbra, but you were formerly at Azavia. And I wondered if you could tell our listeners a little bit about the work that you do currently at Umbra. Yeah, so I work at a pretty neat company right now. Uh, Umbra is something called a synthetic aperture radar company, which is a very fancy sounding uh, type of remote sensing. So basically, we're just taking radar images of Earth and we're doing it from space. And there are some unique characteristics of SAR that uh, I think are pretty exciting and have implications for how maybe the whole Earth observation industry might change over time. So unlike optical imagery, which everybody's familiar with, if you've ever watched the news and seen a satellite image or gone to Google Maps and flipped on the satellite imagery layer, that's all optical imagery, like the same kind of imagery you might take with your cell phone, um, but just taken from space. Uh, the big trouble with that data is that it's cloudy, like most of the time over most of the world. <laughs> and especially the closer you get to the equator, which is where all the people live, it's really cloudy most of the time. And so if you, if you think about optical imagery business models, they're sort of like a hotel and you rent time in, on orbit. It's like renting a hotel room. You tell the camera where to point for that time. It's called tasking a satellite image. Imagine having a hotel where the day before somebody's supposed to check in, like two thirds of the time, you have to send them a message like, sorry, the room's not available. It's cloudy, like you can't take the image. That's a really tough logistical problem to get around. And there's definitely, it's gonna get better as more and more of those satellites go up. But what's neat about SAR is that it can see through clouds. So it's an active sensor. You're, you're sending a beam, a radar beam down, and then you're measuring the backscatter. You're, you're, you're measuring the return, the radar return. And uh, that allows you to see through clouds, see at night, if you wanna see at night. Um, and to me, the the, yeah, people talk about that capability, like, oh, you can see through clouds and see at night. That's so much better than optical. Not really. Like the, the data that you're looking at can be pretty hard to interpret. But the reason I think it's so exciting is that you can build a completely different business model on top of it. You can say, look, we're, we, we have very high confidence that we're going to be able to fulfill your order. So we can give you like a lot more control over the spacecraft and when you want it to take pictures, where you want it to take pictures of, at what resolution. There are some other factors with synthetic aperture radar, like we'll be able to image down below 50 centimeters. 
and actually below 30 centimeters, which is the limit of optical imagery you can buy currently. But we can do that with a tiny little spacecraft. So like a hundred kilogram or less spacecraft versus like a several ton spacecraft that it takes to take optical imagery. And the reason for that is optical imagery, you need a big lens to resolve a really detailed image. And a big lens means a big chassis. And that means it's big cost to get to space and manufacture. But with synthetic aperture radar, you're, you're basically imaging the same area from multiple angles and then taking that series, that time series of data and resolving a single image at a high resolution, um, which allows you to get that high resolution out of like a tiny uh, instrument. So anyway, that was kind of a, a very literal explanation of what we do. I mean, the, the broader implications for what you'll be able to do with the data and stuff, we can get into that. My job is just make the customer experience as awesome as possible. That's what my role is. If you go to buy data from us, I want it to be like, book in a hotel room on Airbnb and not like buying a house, which is the analogy I use for buying satellite imagery today because of all that complexity. And also because a lot of these firms are legacy military firms. Sure. Very hard to buy satellite imagery today. And I don't think it should be. I don't think it has to be. That's absolutely fair. And that's a fantastic analogy that I, again, will reuse the hotel and the, uh, and the buying a home. Um, so when, when, you know, are, are, are Umbra's customers most, most, mostly U.S. government or, or is that, or is it more, would you say? You broke up there for a second for me, but I think you asked, are, are most of our customers focused on U.S. government use cases? Is that, is that the sure. question? Are sort of government use cases or are they more commercial? industry type uh, customers got it um oh am i breaking up I'm... yeah it's okay it, i'm sorry that you, I'm you're, sorry. You're, you're coming through clear yeah. now okay good all, good all good yeah no so i can answer your question um so like the history of synthetic aperture radar it started like it invented in the 50s essentially by the u.s military or at least u.s research uh, invented synthetic aperture radar, mostly used as an airborne capability. So that nighttime capability and being able to see through clouds, if you imagine that's really useful if you have uh, a spy plane way up above the clouds and you're monitoring um, some area, being able to use an active sensor that can see through the clouds and give you a map of what's happening. So mostly it was airborne missions. Um, but I think as early as like the 70s or 80s, they started launching spaceborne SAR systems. But this says for the majority of the existence of this technology, it's been a military technology, an intelligence gathering technology. Um, so as a commercial firm, what we're trying to do is, yeah, there are definitely still going to be US government and even military applications of the data. Um, but they've said explicitly, like, we don't want any US companies, even the optical ones, we don't want anyone reliant on government funds to survive as a business. We want you to be commercially viable. So the way that like Maxar, uh, for instance, Planet, the way that those companies have set their businesses up, they try to be commercially viable without a US government customer. Like if they vanished overnight, which they hopefully won't, but they would still survive. And that's very much the same way that we'll set our business up. Um, so. Yeah, there will, there will be US government customers, but our hope is that the majority of our customers are commercial customers. That's not gonna happen overnight because there is no large commercial uh, industry currently for synthetic aperture radar. Like most people don't know what to do with it. There aren't even like good open source software tools to work with it yet. So that's something that we might have to invest in just giving away tooling to make it easier to use our data. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, we think there are just incredible opportunities, not just in like energy and mining and, you know, natural resources management, agriculture, sure, those are, but like in measuring the effects of climate change and rapid response during a disaster and mapping critical infrastructure or mapping any infrastructure in very high resolution in, in many parts of the world, where I think a lot of people think that the world is mapped, but most of the world is not mapped. And so having an inexpensive way to quickly queue up 
like a high resolution picture of what's going on in an area. That's our that's our mission, and we think people will find really inventive and creative commercial uses for that data over time. Um, so what those are, there'll be many and they'll be very diverse and it's hard to predict. It's kind of an emergent thing, which is part of why I'm so excited to work on it. But the prerequisite that you need, the prior is cheap, accessible, openly licensed data without many constraints so that people can exercise that imagination and creativity. Whereas today they really can't afford to or legally um, are constrained so much that they can't act out on certain ideas that they have about how this data could be used in a commercial setting. It just isn't feasible today. And we're, we're hoping to help change that. Wow, well, I'm really excited to see what Umber does. And it's thank you for breaking down really complicated topics into just really simple, interesting ones. And <laughs> so I, I, I have, since I, I, could, I could literally spend two hours asking you questions, but I won't. I have three questions for you. What do you see as, and there's so many, I know, but what do, you, what do you see as some of the most exciting trends in the geospatial industry? I know that there's just, if you read your blog, it's too numerous to count, but if you had to maybe, you know, synthesize it into maybe three big ones, what would you say the most exciting ones are for you? Three most exciting trends in geospatial. Okay, for me, this is all very just personal taste, because sure. like you said, um, but number one for me is 3D visualization in the browser. Uh, and, and I think a broader way of framing that trend is the effect that video games are now having on the technology that affects how mapping applications are built. It's not a new trend. If you look at the history of uh, Google Maps, for instance, Keyhole, which was the name of the company that was acquired by Google that eventually was the kind of core of what became Google Maps. Keyhole was a f the remnants of a failed video game technology and startup. So people trying oh, to build really interactive, cool, you know, globe, 3D globe, video game stuff, couldn't hack it as video game developers, eventually built you know, this great mapping technology that was a lot of people, including my own, like opened my eyes to what you could do with the internet and mapping. Um, and then actually John Hankey, who was right. one of the co-founders, now runs a video game company. I, it it builds Pokemon Go and all that. So yeah, I, I, I think that interplay between there's so much money and entertainment. And I, I think that one of the big, biggest governors on the growth of the geospatial industry is that sense of delight and wonder and entertainment engagement that drives the best experiences people have had with maps. Maybe it's like the first time they used Google Maps to navigate somewhere in their car without a Garmin. And they're like, whoa, my phone can do this, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, and or maybe it's like a 3D visualization like Google Earth, but taking some of the principles and technologies from video games and applying them to very rote everyday activities, making them feel more engrossing and more engaging and, and and more exciting. I think that is the number one trend that I'm excited about. And hopefully it's gonna show up in some of the stuff that I'm working on at Umbra too. And, and that gets me really excited. Um, okay, that was number one. Number two uh, mm -hmm. is sensors on phones probably. Um, so like, the new iPhones and the new iPad Pros, you can get them with LiDAR sensors built into them, like, which is nuts. I mean, LiDAR sensors have typically been the domain of survey equipment and, you know, more recently like autonomous vehicles and stuff. But the fact that you can, I don't know, you can use your phone to like scan an object in, in <laughs> high fidelity or do range finding or, there's like Chris Anderson, who um, he was the CEO of uh, uh, 3D Robotics. He, he started a DIY autonomous car meetup in San Francisco. I mean, you use the phone and then like a chassis and, and you can run autonomous, many autonomous RV vehicles just with the phone and software running on it. Um, that, that type of stuff gets me excited too, that we just have these supercomputers in our pocket and people are gonna find inventive ways to leverage them to generate more information about the world um, and higher fidelity, that's very exciting. 
And then if, if I had to pick a third, um, it, it has, I have to say deep learning, like machine learning, especially deep learning as a subdomain is changing the way we can sort through massive amounts of relatively unstructured data. And that's just exciting to me because, you know, as somebody that works at a company that's going to be producing a ton of relatively unstructured data, you know, it'll be somewhat structured, but it'll, the information will not be structured inside of that data. You need ways to reduce that down to a human scale and find the signal in it. And I think deep learning is the most exciting kind of cross-cutting technology that I've seen for being able to structure unstructured data. I don't think it's like the magic bullet that people make it out to be. I'm not afraid of machines taking over the world anytime mm -hmm. soon. And I've worked on machine learning systems and seen how fragile they can be, but there's still no substitute to a, a, a highly trained deep learning model that's just going to town, taking a really big data set and reducing it to some really fine signal with, with relatively um, good tolerances and, and error bars that that's probably the most exciting trend outside of the first two for me. Well, uh, well, I, I feel like the, on the first, I have just, just, I have too many things to say to you, Joe. So I'm just Go gonna just ask away. We got okay. time. There's no rush. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, the, on the first thing I, I, you know, I'm in this 3d modeling class right now and we've been learning how to use unity to, to help, you know, create things. And there's so much 3d mapping in unity and in unreal engine. And it's mm. just, really cool to see what you can do and the, the the pokemon go connection is interesting but you said that keyhole was actually a gaming company before I didn't, I didn't that i didn't know yeah not it wasn't called keyhole but the the folks who founded keyhole they yeah. were running a gaming startup that failed they they laid everybody off and then they took the remnants of that intellectual property that they had worked on and they started keyhole they only lasted I want to say two years, two and a half years before Google acquired them. They never got big as a mapping company. They were acquired for, I don't know, a few million dollars in, in Google shares. All those guys, if they had held on to their shares, which I hope they did, they all got fantastically wealthy from a fairly modest exit. And they built a business. I mean, Google Maps today is is a is worth probably $10 billion plus by itself, makes billions of dollars in revenue a year. Um, just an insane, and probably the most successful mapping project of all time. Uh, maybe you could argue that OpenStreetMap is is as successful, but I think Google still has the edge. Um, so yeah, and all because some some guys that wanted to build a video game startup couldn't couldn't quite figure it out. You know, that's like the same story with Slack. They were working on a video game and took their internal communications really? tool. And yeah, I, I would say that in general video games tend to be the cutting edge of user experience design and huh. browser technology. That, that would be, I feel pretty comfortable saying that. That's where you see most of the innovation coming. Um, and you think about it, it's because they have to render these crazy high fidelity textures on limited hardware, well, not so limited anymore, but it used to be limited hardware. All the compression algorithms that have been invented there, the all that stuff, it's like, hasn't still hasn't really made its way to mapping uh, in any serious ways, which is interesting to me. But yeah, I would I would pay a lot of attention there. That's fascinating. Yeah, I've always thought that there's such an interesting. This is on a personal level. There's there's such an interesting mapping element. I don't know if you you're a GTA player, but I always oh, find yeah. it so interesting how they they've literally mapped the entirety of Los Angeles to <laughs> GTA. This is really cool. Yeah, sorry, connecting. Oh, and, and look at. Is, yeah. If you like that, look up uh, look up the new Microsoft Flight Simulator. Have you seen that? It's hard to tell the difference between what's the simulation and what's the actual photo. It's really mind bending. People will build video games. I think I'm more excited for video games that take place in virtual environments that are very realistic than I am for augmented reality video games like Pokemon Go. That's less exciting to me just because the interfaces aren't there yet for it to feel like an engrossing experience. I don't know, what are you supposed to wear? Like you're supposed to look at your phone to see what's happening or wear some clunky headset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they crack that nut, I think it'll be fun. But yeah, like playing Grand Theft Auto. I remember playing Grand Theft Auto in high school and just stealing an airplane and just flying around, like flying low and like looking at the map and, you know, 
I mean, that, that was probably the best part of it was just un, like the map is so incredible. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. And I feel like you'll see the best, the best software applications in mapping, they're going to start to feel more like video games. I feel very confident in that. That is so cool. It's so exciting. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay. So next one is more, um, more, I guess maybe like career related, um, which is, you know, you have a software engineering background from what it's from what it seems, but you also have this more industry back, you know, knowledge as well. So I, I wonder as young geospatial technologists who may be listening or, you know, myself, um, what, what do you think the best skills are to equip yourself with when in sort of going into the geo world? What the sort of the, the major skill sets you see being expedient? Yeah, I, uh, I got some really good advice when my parents dropped me off at college. And my dad said that he doesn't remember saying this to me, but it stuck with me really clearly. They dropped me off at the dorm room. It's like an empty dorm room, no furniture. It looks like a prison cell, essentially. <laughs> and uh, they sort of like, you know, say their goodbyes and leave. And then my dad pops back in the room. And I remember he said something along the lines of like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And your mother and I don't know anybody, so get started. And then he <laughs> left. And that is like the best advice I've ever gotten. Like it really, if you want to launch a career in any industry, do exactly what you are doing. Okay. Go and interview people and learn about that career and then share that information back to other people uh, and, and be generous with what you learn. And, you know, I write on the blog and that's not really being generous. That's just kind of catharsis for me, but, um, that has done more for my career than anything else I've done. And I, I really do think like people can learn a lot from even, even, yeah, like it doesn't take, I mean, it's hard work and consistency is like the most important thing, but there is no course you can take. There's no college you can get into. There's no magic lever if you can produce useful information for people and share it back with them that will come back to you like tenfold uh so that, that that's the best thing you can do for your career 100 percent. okay um so final question um and then just because i also wanted to Grab just pick your brain after this, the end of each interview, um, uh, to describe a time where they were lost, whether in your um, in your life or career or geographically, um, and how you found your way back again. Yeah, um, yeah, you warned me about this question. I should have given it a lot of thought. Oh, you don't need to. <laughs> it's such a great question. I mean, I love I love the philosophical underpinning of it. Um, yeah, I. I did think about it a little bit. There, there was a time in my life, I was a junior in high school. Yeah, I was a junior and maybe I was a sophomore in high school going into my junior year. I think that's what it was. Um, I was either going to junior year or senior year. I guess it doesn't really matter. There was this program called Governor's School in North Carolina. And all the smartest kids from across the state got into Governor's School. And they went and they pretended to be college students for a summer. They got college coursework. You know, they smoked weed and got high together in college <laughs> alleys, whatever the hell they did. They, people would go to this thing and they would come back totally changed. Like mm -hmm. they met the smartest people they'd ever met. They befriended people. It changed their life. My best friend, Stacy Harden, got in the year before me, came back totally changed. Like he just, it almost was a bad thing because he had a hard time just going back to high school after seeing what it was like on the other side. But that was all I cared about was getting into governor's school. That was like the validation that I was looking for. And I didn't get in, I got rejected. Well, yeah, I got rejected. They lost my application. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't technically get rejected, but I didn't get in. Uh, and I got through like three rounds of interviews and they, and they never called me back about how it went, whether I got into the fourth round and then they were like, oh yeah, we lost your application, whatever. Long story short, I was devastated. Like I thought that was all I was aiming at for, from the time I was a freshman in high school to that moment was get into governor's school, get the grades, 
focus. And then without governor's school, I was looking at another summer of being a camp counselor for four and five year olds, scraping their vomit off the floor of the locker room, explaining to their parents why they had a gash across their face. Oh like I'll, I'll just, you know, and it's like summers in North Carolina are like 95 degrees and 95% humidity. I was just looking at that job and thinking I was lost. Basically I felt lost. Um, and my mom took me aside when, when I was kind of in the throes of this depression after not getting into governor's school. And she made me an offer that if I took all of my savings from the previous summers that I had spent working and I had a little money saved from when I used to like raise and sell sheep as a kid, which sounds weird, but my mom was a 4-H <laughs> agent. So she got me this gig where I could like take care of sheep and keep the money when they got sold at auction to be killed and eaten, I guess, or whatever you do with sheep, but uh, horrible animals. But anyway, she, she took me aside and said, if you put all of your money that you've saved uh, up, I will match it. And you can go on a trip this summer, a month long backpacking trip um, to, through this program called Knowles, National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, and of course I said like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I, I thought about it for like two seconds and said I would anything but going back to that summer job. And yeah, that trip completely changed my life. Like the fact that she did that and took me aside and showed me a path to something I could do with my time and, and offered, you know, I still had skin in the game. I had to put up all the money I'd saved, but I couldn't afford something like that on my own. Um, and, and I, you know, my parents are not super wealthy people. They, um, yeah, they had to sacrifice to give me that opportunity and, yeah, I, I'll never forget that. That was one of the kindest things that anyone's ever done for me. But definitely out there in the woods in Wyoming, up there in the Wind River Range, like we literally were orienteering. We had maps and compasses and we were every day it'd be like, you got to get to this spot. There's no trail. Figure out how to get there. And then the last week of it, they said, congratulations, meet us here. It's like 50 miles away or 75 miles away. And like, we'll see you there in seven days and they just left us <laughs> and uh yeah that was a very liberating experience gave me a lot of confidence i met some lifelong friends um and definitely found found a new direction in my life found, found a new a newfound sense of purpose that um yeah i still i i owe my mom a, a huge debt of gratitude for for helping me in that in that moment that's wonderful what a great loss story <laughs> yeah, I, as a former camp counselor, I definitely, definitely feel that. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I would not go back, but, but uh, definitely makes me appreciate when I have a summer where I, yeah, not, not doing that. <laughs> yeah, let's just take a second. God bless all the summer camp counselors. I, I mean, know. I coronavirus, know. people are going to be vaccinated. Yes. Those camp counselors are going to be dealing with kids, four or five year olds who have been cooped up for a full year. Oh, good point. Those, those, those are saints. Those people that are doing the camp council counseling stuff, I, that there are that is the hardest job I've ever done. I hope it's the hardest job I ever have to do, and God bless them because that is a very difficult job. Star data and, and, and you know machine learning, computer vision algorithms, but 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 being a camp counselor was still still harder, still. Still more way harder. Are you kidding me? This is <laughs> way harder. That was just hard work. That was like roll up your sleeves, deal with a crisis every single day. So it was so hard. And uh, but, you know, and then the worst part was that Stacy, that guy that I mentioned, who was like my best buddy. Um, he didn't give a shit like he sorry, I just curse, but he he would show up, not pay attention. When we played dodgeball with the kids, he would just like mercilessly beat them in dodgeball. <laughs> and like physically hurt kids and stuff. And, and they loved him. They adored him. They thought he was like a living God. Like the worse he treated them and the more he ignored them, the, he had this like posse of like people that would just follow him around and at his beck and call. And meanwhile, I'm working my butt off trying to help these kids and be nice to them and like, get, you know, help them out and police what's going on or whatever. And they hated me. I absolutely thought I was the like the dumbest <laughs> worst camp camp counselor 
And, and uh, that infuriated, infuriated me too, because he was like nonchalant. He probably thought it was a great job. If you ask him <laughs> what was it like being a camp counselor, he'd probably tell you it was, it was fine. What do you mean? Uh, so yeah, some people are cut out for it. I was not. Wow. Well, it's <laughs> hilarious. Um, well, um, thank you so much for coming on the show, Joe, um, and for making me laugh. Um, if you could stick around, that'd be awesome. Um, but uh, I really appreciate your time and I will always be reading and I will always be sending your articles to everyone I know and I encourage our listeners to do the same. Thank you so much. And seriously, thank you for inviting me on. This has been an honor. And uh, oh. if I can help recruit other guests to the show or anything, just let me know. I, I think this is a lot of fun and, and what you're doing is great.